again, everyone. Welcome to the third and final day of the Truth and Journalism Conference. We're so excited to have you all here again in person and online. Um, I'm just going to give a really brief sort of practical information rundown again for anybody new uh, who's come here today uh, for the first time, I guess, if you're new, it's the first time that you're here. Um, so just to start, uh, I'm Alison Baker. I'm the co-organizer of this conference and co-lead on the Truth in Journalism Project. Um, if you can't see me, I'm standing at a podium in uh, a room at the Carleton, uh, at Carleton University School of Journalism. Um, I am wearing a black blazer and bright blue pants. Um, and behind me is uh, a logo for the, the Carleton School of Journalism. And to my left is Samia Madwar. Uh, the moderator of today's panel. Um, so for any of the in-person attendants, the bathrooms uh, are just at the door to your left. Um, there's also a uh, water fountain out there. There's some uh, refreshments in the back of the room, coffee uh, and some muffins, it looks like, which delicious. Please help yourselves. Um, and yeah, I think that's everything. Uh, just in terms of mask wearing, uh, Vivian and I will be wearing masks while we're sitting down um, and they'll be off while we're speaking. Uh, feel free to do whatever feels comfortable for you, but that's just what we're gonna be doing. Um, so I will stop talking and let uh, Samia take it away for the Journalism uh, Ethics and Objectivity panel, our first of the day. Uh, and yeah, Samia, take it away. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, it's nice to be here this morning. Uh, if you're not able to see me, I'm, uh, I was trying to think of how to describe myself, uh, and I'm following Vivian and Ali's cue from their opening on Wednesday night. So I'm a woman in her mid-30s, 35, if we're going to be transparent, um, <laughs> with, uh, with what used to be brown hair but is now mostly gray. Um, and I'm in a blue stripy shirt. Um, and it's wonderful to be here this morning. Um, the room is about half full um, with some familiar to me faces, which is really wonderful. And I know that some of you are um, tuning in. Um, and uh, this panel, um, the title is Objectivity and Ethics in Journalism. And we had the option to rename our panel, but I thought, let's be straightforward. It's about objectivity and ethics. Um, and one thing that I'd like to do is um, start by introducing myself and I'll ask uh, each of our panelists to introduce themselves as well. Um, and with this introduction, I originally was just going to say my name is Samia Medwar and I'm a senior editor at The Walrus. Um, but I also, because we're talking about objectivity and ethics, I think it's important to think about, uh, to situate ourselves, as Ali put it earlier this morning, to think about where we're coming from and what perspective we're bringing to every conversation that we participate in or listen to. Um, and so with that in mind, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, it's, it's actually wonderful to be back here at Carleton because, um, uh, and in Ottawa, because my introduction to journalism was, uh, I, I was a fact checker at Canadian Geographic here in Ottawa. Um, a long time ago, uh, and then went to journalism school here at Carleton. So it's like coming back full circle to fact checking and to journalism education. So it's really wonderful to be here. Um, I, uh, I was born in Canada but was not raised here. Uh, I, I grew up in Syria, in Damascus, Syria, and came here when I was 18 um, as a university student and have been here ever since. Um, and so the perspective that I bring when people ask me how I identify um, uh, I, I think of myself as a dual citizen, and that's a very big part of my identity as a Syrian Canadian, um, someone who grew up in Syria, my family Syrian, um, it is still home to me. Um, but I also feel Canadian. I was born in Montreal, I'm a Canadian citizen, I've been here for th in my entire adult life, um, and that's formed uh, an essential part of my identity as well. And so that is the perspective that I bring. Um, and uh, so now I'd love to hear from our panelists. Um, and I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves in, uh, in whatever way that you like. Um, so maybe, uh, Karen, you would like to start? Hi, can you hear me all right? Excellent. Yes, we can. Uh, so I'm Karen Pugliese. Um, I am, my biography always says I'm best known for uh, my political reporting or my time at Aboriginal People's Television Network. Um, and I think I'm still brand associated in some ways with uh, Indigenous reporting, but I'm doing climate reporting these days and I'm the executive editor of uh, Canada's National Observer. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, Susanna, would you like to introduce yourself? 
Yes, hi, my name is Susanna Siegel. I'm a philosophy professor at Harvard University. I'm not a journalist, but I regard journalists as the heroines and heroes of our time. I'm very interested in democracy and the role of journalism in democracy. Um, my own work has been about epistemology and perception. I've been um, writing on those topics for several decades. Um, I've also um, a little bit more recently started working in, in political philosophy and issues in epistemology. And I designed a course um, called uh, Truth lies in the press. I would have called it the philosophy of journalism, but nobody takes classes like mm -hmm. that because what's the philosophy of journalism? There's never been a course like this in the offered in the Harvard philosophy department, but it's just been really fantastic um, to get to know lots of journalists and to think about the role of journalism in democracy. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. And I guess I'll also add, since our topic is objectivity, that if you ask a philosopher to talk about objectivity, we might never shut up. Um, you know, we talk about this concept in lots of different domains. So. Um, so I'm looking forward to talking with all of you today and it's an honor to be in dialogue with you. Thank you so much, Susanna. Um, and last but of course not least, uh, Matthew, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Matthew Demera. Uh, I use they and he pronouns. Um, I started off in mainstream media um, doing local television and I've sort of slowly moved into more independent media uh, and now I'm the founder of The Resolve, which is a publication uh, focused on Black, Indigenous, and communities of color. Thank you um, to all of you. Um, and now, um, Susanna, you, uh, you've kind of preempted me. I'm going to ask each of you, um, how do you define objectivity? And what does the term mean to you in the context of journalism? Just so we can kind of lay the foundation for the discussion today. Matthew, maybe you can start us off. Oh, I've been uh, dreading this question all week, actually. Um, I was really hoping to go last. Uh, I, I, I don't like objectivity. I think that's where I'll start. Um, I think it's really challenging to have this conversation because I think often we're talking about different things. I'm, you know, I'm saying obje objectivity and perhaps you're hearing neutrality or impartiality or maybe nonpartisanship. Uh, so, you know, there are elements within ob objectivity that I, uh, I think are valuable. And then there are others that I find to be very harmful and um, uh, that have really done, I think, a disservice to journalism uh, in the terms of the ideals that we all like to espouse. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there and let uh, Karen and Susanna jump off from there, maybe. Um. Karen or Susanna, whoever wants to go second, <laughs> since I imposed first <laughs> on poor Matthew. I, I can go second. Um, when I was a student at Carleton University in uh, Journalism 100, um, the professor told us, None of, nobody's objective. Objectivity is a bit of a myth. All you can do is be balanced and fair. And I thought we'd solve this whole thing. I, ju I just went with it from there, you know. Um, but it, I think it's come up a lot uh, recently again because we're getting newsrooms are becoming more diverse. And uh, I was really trying to think of like a great way to explain what I think happens and where where the tension is right now in the conversation, at least at least for me. And um, I was I thought, okay, here's a great way to describe it. Um, Russia invaded the Ukraine. How do we feel about that? Are we really going to false balance what's happening there and give equal time to Putin as we do to the Ukrainian people? Was the coverage not just a little bit more emotional about what the Ukrainian people are, are suffering, especially as we, we went on through the coverage and um, we were seeing you know, children out playing violins in the rubble? Um, you know, it, it, there's, there's something about a pursuit of truth that in itself is defiant of objectivity. And so when I come at this from an indigenous point of view, and I'm informed by a sense of history and a sense of uh, place and a sense of facts that maybe other people in the newsroom don't have access to. I used to sign off in Ottawa when I was a journalist and I'd say, um, you know, because I was working at AP10 and you could do these things. I would say, um, I'm Karen Pugliese signing off from the unceded ter territory of the Algonquins that is today known as Ottawa. And that, that was very controversial back in 2000. Nowadays, we, we, we do uh, land acknowledgements and it's not. 
Um, but you know, when I, a reporter recently, and this is the last point I'll make, uh, cause I wanna keep it brief, but a reporter recently that I, I'm still in touch with quite a bit, who used to work at APTN, Brandy Morin, um, she wrote to me just around the time that Russia had invaded the Ukraine. And she said that she pitched an article that had been turned down. And I said, don't, don't tell me, I'm gonna guess. Were you comparing the invasion of Russia to the Ukraine to the invasion of our lands? And she was like, yeah. And I said, yeah, I see why they wouldn't run it. But it was so funny because I was at the CBC at the time. And I said, I just had that same conversation with uh, my manager and at the CBC, would we ever run a story like that? Um, and so I think the, 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 the reason she couldn't get it into the papers because she couldn't get people to step out of, of their version of objectivity, which is informed by perhaps a white gaze, um, to see her where she was coming from, which was also uh, seeking truth. So, so that's where the tension is, I think, on objectivity today. Thank you, Karen. Um, and I've made a note in my notebook here to reach out to Brandy. Uh, Susanna, <laughs> what are your thoughts? How do you define objectivity and, and how do you think about the term uh, in the context of journalism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I, I, think I'm, I think I'm agreeing with much of um, what Matthew and Catherine said, and particularly Matthew's point about people meaning different things by it really resonates to me. And I guess as I see it, um, there are ways that the term is weaponized. And I think of those as ways that it's abused um, mm -hmm. and misapplied. And then there are, really are things that are objectivity that I consider in a different category. Um, and in that category, I find six things. Is it possible to share my screen? It's okay if not. Um, but I, just because there are six, I could actually- I, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm um, seeing anyway, nods. It, it, Vivian's yeah. on the case. <laughs> I'll, I'll just- um, I'll just list them. I mean, because if we think of how we use the word, I mean, what makes these all different is that there are different things to, that are said to be able to be objective. And, um, and one thing that runs through all six of them, I think, is that objectivity is a positively valenced word. Within journalism, you know, when it's weaponized, one develops other associations with it. But I think in the sort of wider context, when we have these debates, um, you know, within journalism, it's sort of as with any discipline or profession, some in-house debates just stay in-house, but others really attract the attention of other publics. And I think this is one that absolutely does attract that attention of other publics, partly because there are objectivity debates in other disciplines and sciences and history and perception, um, but also because everybody's heard of the word. And, and when a term is positively valenced, if we position ourselves in responding to the way it's weaponized, um, by saying, I'm against it, we gain ourselves a sort of uphill battle because it has it. I mean, when I say positive advance, I should just back up. I mean, you know, some words like babies, you know, good or bad, like good, you know, spiders. Um, and it's not so much that you have these complicated thoughts about babies or spiders, but in political rhetoric, if you paint your opponent as being against babies and you're for babies, you have scored a rhetorical point. And sometimes I worry um, that if we position ourselves in responding to the weaponization of objectivity as it's used against um, you know, anti-racist journalism, against movement journalism, if we position ourselves by saying, I don't want that anyway, it's sort of, we, we, we put ourselves in an uphill battle. But um, so that's just a point about rhetoric, but I also think there's, you know, sort of substantively, here are my six things. Um, uh, and I think you, sh you should be able to share your screen. Okay, yeah, let me try to do that. Um, somebody remind me where the share, oh, here it is, share screen right there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Okay, I'm hoping, praying this is the right document, hang on. Um, <laughs> that's, that's quite all right. <laughs> you have many seasoned Zoom users here who Ooh, all yeah. have had to share their screens. <laughs> okay. so, so, you In know, sometimes past. we talk about uh, assertions being objective, you know, like th this, this, you know, this belief, or, you know, this, this sentence, this thing somebody said, she's, you know, her remark is objective. And that's just some sort of very vague epistemic virtue, basically just using it to say, this is some generic good thing. Um, other times when people talk about objective truth or facts, I never let my students use the word, I, whenever they write that in a paper, I'm like, look, that's not adding anything. You know, like it's just, it's just another way of saying that something's true. Um, sometimes we talk about objective descriptions. These are all different things, you know, an assertion, um, a truth or a fact that is, you know, somebody is asserting um, a description 
like, you know, objective police reports, they say, you know, you, you, you sort of minimize inferences, you just talk about what's sensorily observable. So you say things like, you know, she was scratching her arm, not that she was itchy, or that, you know, he kept wringing his hands, but not that he was nervous. And um, I don't think any of these things are really, any of these first three things are particularly relevant to journalism, because oftentimes journalism does have to talk about people's mental states or motivations, and obviously much that's reported is not perceptually observable. It's when we start talking about objective people that the mischief really begins. Um, so, you know, sometimes we talk about objective observers, so some, as somebody who's not really invested in something emotionally or has no prior suspicion. And there can be such a thing like relative to a situation, you know, you go to a family therapist who isn't in the throes of the family's world of conflict and feeling. Um, and so that's why you're going there. So there are in that sort of innocuous sense, uh, uh, an objective observer or a journal referee for a scientific paper is not trying to like prove a hypothesis that the scientist is. Um, so those things exist. Um, and then, so that's, there is such a thing as an objective observer in that sense, but only in this very relational way. And then the other thing that doesn't exist, that's sort of, you know, said to be a myth and really is a chimera. And so therefore we shouldn't have a debate about it is people somehow have no perspective at all. And, you know, it's often pointed out correctly, that's a myth. Now, I don't think either of these things are really directly relevant to journalism either. They're sort of, I think of them as sort of clumsy ways to talk about the thing that really matters, as I think Tom Rosenstiel mentioned yesterday and has said in his other work, and lots of people have made this point that, you know, there's, there's methods could be objective, methods could be objective. And what does that mean? You know, it just means this, it just means that one is in inquiry, one is seeking evidence for claims, one is seeking explanations for events, one is tracing the pros and the cons of so far unverified hypotheses or un, as yet undecided proposals. And, you know, the key point, as I see it, is that you don't have to be an objective observer in the people sense to be um, in inquiry, to be using objective methods. And, you know, so much of the, you know, wonderful journalism that's come under attack, whether it's the 1619 Project or Cassant Matar's work or Wes Lowry or Felisa Sonmez and so on, and you could all give many other examples I know, you know, it's perfectly objective in these senses. So I think when we're over in this corner, we're talking about, well, what really is it? Is it a thing? Um, it's many things. And so here I'm agreeing with Matthew. When we're when we're dealing with attacks on incredibly vital and pro-democratic journalism that use this word that, that, that try to leverage the fact that there's just a positive valence to objectivity. And therefore, if you want to attack someone, you say they're not objective, they're an advocate or there's some other thing. Um, those, I don't want to give away the word to those critics. That's my one observation from where I'm standing, which is outside the practice of journalism. There could be all sorts of reasons you know, that are that I'm blind to, which they probably are, um, that they're just not visible to me because I'm not enmeshed in the practice. But from what I can see, it, it does seem like we're buying ourselves a sort of uphill battle if we say, I don't like objectivity, where we're letting them define objectivity as this, you know, as uh, something that's just a sort of very vague, um, you know, supposedly, supposed virtue that the journalists and journals and they're attacking don't have. So sorry for going on a bit, but those are my initial thoughts. No need to apologize. Um, uh, this is, I think, a, a good um, segue into uh, the next question, which I, you know, it's my favorite question because I would have so much trouble answering this <laughs> question. Um, maybe, maybe Karen, you'd like to start with this one. Um, what are some situations where you think objectivity and ethics might come into conflict? where objectivities and ethics come into conflict. I feel like I need a prompt. <laughs> I'm still thinking about what Susan <laughs> said. Um, actually, I, I wanted to, to comment a bit on that and the objective method. And, and maybe this is, maybe I can get from here to there. Um, I, I also believe that you can have an objective method. Um, I think sometimes it's, it's failed um, because we're not uh, rigorous enough at asking questions or sort of moving outside our headspace to try to understand what we're doing. And that's, I'm, I'm being vague here. Okay, so um, one of the examples where I think um, objective method fails us has been in the coverage of missing and murdered indigenous women. And it's a topic that I bring up just because it was, it was just so really well studied um, by academics who took a look really at um, how Indigenous women were covered. 
And um, I think one of the key reasons that a lot of indigenous journalists have told me that they've left uh, journalism, why they leave, is because they're not able to get their stories or stories that they feel are important to the community out there. And that, that's kind of on track with what happened with the coverage of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Uh, very early on, uh, you would get articles that would say something like, you know, there's a dead Indian down by the river. And um, I think the reason that that happened is because um, somebody taking a look at a dead body down by the river said, well, you know, it's probably, you know, a white male in the, in the newsroom trying to figure out why the story might be important to people like him, people, you know, coming from his perspective. We all do this. We, we all uh, judge stories by how relevant they are through our own experience and our own lens. And so he might say, well, the thing that you really need to know, or my community really needs to know, is that there's a bad element down there by the river. And I don't want uh, my children, we shouldn't let our children down there until the police move that element along and it's safe for them. But really not expecting that what might have happened to that Indigenous woman would ever happen to their children. So, so the stories kind of were, were titled like that and were kind of written from that perspective. Um, it's not that they're not following an objective method, but, it, but there is sort of a personal bias that, that comes into them. Uh, a similar story about missing white women uh, might have, you know, the name in the title. It might be Alice, please come home or, you know, this mother is missing. So um, there, there's a number of Indigenous women over the years who would try to pitch these stories or say, you know, this is a social phenomenon. It's not just a one-off case. There's something happening to our people and it's very important. And I think they're just coming from a, a place of information that maybe is not otherwise in the newsroom. And there's there's gatekeepers that are keeping the stories from being told in that way, um, or being or, or seeing the whole picture that another journalist might see. So uh, when it comes into the ethics of reporting, um, there there is something unethical about. Uh, and I don't think, you know, I, I don't want to say like it's it's on purpose, but there's something unethical about the way we, the, the system of journalism reinforces stereotypes about uh, Indigenous people because it's filtered through this bias, even if the method, even if we think we're using objective methods. Thank you um, for that. Um, Matthew, would you like to respond to the question? And as a reminder, the, the question was, you know, in, in your view, what are some situations where objectivity and ethics might come into conflict? Um, and you can also take a step back and just kind of consider both terms, um, how, how they relate to, to each other. Um, I was really struck, I think, by the, the word, the use of the word rigorous there um, in terms of, of how that method might be applied. Um, it's, because uh, I, th I think most, I think most newsrooms in Canada, at least, I think most news newsrooms here um, would say that they operate using an objective method, and yet we end up with very different results um, in terms of in terms of the stories that are chosen, in terms of what stories don't get covered, as, as Karen has pointed out, uh, in terms of who gets declared to be uh, an authoritative voice, who who gets who has to be questioned and who doesn't. Uh, uh, there's there's all sorts of elements that come in and and, and I and I appreciated uh, Susanna's uh, breakdown of all, of all the different types of objectivity there I think that was really helpful um, and I and I'm I still I still question the objective method because uh, I would say everyone says they're practicing it but I don't agree with the results um, and so with without that element of, of rigorous application I think um, I'm still kind of going to argue against objectivity, at least at least in the terms that we're talking about it here, uh, because I think it's it often becomes a shield uh, for bad practices and a shield for uh, journalism that I I think is harmful uh, and destructive, both for communities and, and for journalism as a as an industry and as a practice. Um, 
I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, I think, maybe um, just in terms of um, uh, police coverage. I think that's a really like a really solid example <laughs> everywhere across the country. Um, and it's not just a historical problem. It is still ongoing in terms of how uh, I think journalism fails to cover um, policing specifically uh, or the police as uh, topics of conversation. Um, uh, whether we're using the police as a source uh, in, in terms of the way we republish press releases essentially unchallenged uh, in ways that we would never do for any other source or, or for most other sources. Um, we don't ask for, well, how do you know this? How did you, how did you get this information about this suspect? Um, and so I think there's this, um, it's not that I'm, again, it's not that I'm objecting to the principles within objectivity. I'm objecting to the way that it's used. And, and um, I think you, you've, you've pointed out as, as weaponized. I'm not sure that it's even like, I'm not even sure that some of these actors who I would consider to be less than uh, rigorous are, are weaponizing it. It's just, um, I think it's a way that it can be used to justify certain viewpoints or certain lived experiences in society. Um, and I think overall it has been used to sort of protect uh, and justify coverage that really favors, uh, and I'm, I'm generalizing here, but a, a male, educated, white, cisgender um, perspective. And, and so you end up with, you know, even in the absence of, of malice, you end up with stories like, like Karen is pointing out with um, missing and murdered women, um, where it's not, it's not a, uh, it's not, it's not malicious necessarily. It's just, it doesn't relate to their lived experience and how it impacts their world. Um, and we see the same thing across, you know, other coverages of the same situation with um, uh, the Bruce MacArthur killings in Toronto. I, I moved to Toronto in 2014. And within the first few weeks, I was hearing stories about missing, um, uh, this, missing um, mostly brown uh, gay men. And I was new to Toronto. I didn't have any connections. I didn't know anyone. And I heard that story within you know, the first month of me coming here. Uh, and uh, you know, more men died. And it wasn't until a gay white man died that the police <laughs> changed their perspective and investigated and found this serial killer who was hiding in, in plain sight, essentially. Um, it's, and and you know, we're talking about the police, but the media coverage uh, mirrored that as well. Um, you know, when when community members brought those stories to uh, to the media, um, the police sort of said, "Well, there's no story here," and that was sort of taken just as uh, you know, the police are authorities, and we should defer to them. Um, anyway, I'm going to ramble, so I'm going to I'm going to end there. But I I I, I do think uh, you know when I'm looking at ethics and objectivity uh, in these contexts, I, I think looking through the lens of policing. Um, really shows, I think, the, the dire straits that we are still in. Because like, we've been having these conversations for a long time, and yet I still see police press releases published all the time and everywhere. It's not a, even, even though reporters in those newsroom acknowledge this conversation and would agree and, and would be, yes, you're right, they still do it. It still happens every day in this country. I think we'll hear more about that in uh, our keynote lecture later today. Um, Susanna, I'd love your thoughts on, on this question of um, how, how objectivity and ethics relate. Yeah, thanks. Um, and, and, and thanks to the co-panelists for all those thoughts. Um, I guess as I see it, the key issue um, when it comes to just working out how we're going to think about objectivity is what vocabulary should we use to describe these problematic journalistic practices. Um, what vocabulary should we use for that? And um, I think my co-panelists are inclined to use the vocabulary of objectivity to describe the things going wrong, whether it's the gatekeeping role or the kind of unfair, really just frankly discriminatory um, responses to often journalists of color and to anti-racist journalism, or whether it's regarding police reports, you know, as treating it as like a press release and then not as something that itself has to be verified, but as something uh, that is itself a source of verification. Um, so those are all deep problems and and um, just holding constant that they're problems, what vocabulary they're doing is to describe them. And, and so one option is to use the, you know, reach for the vocabulary of objectivity because that, and partly because that's how the actors in these situations who are 
who are promulgating these problematic practices. That's how they describe what they're doing. Um, and my worry about that is it's a little bit like, you know, Xi, Xi Jinping, you know, said, oh, guess what? I, this is democracy. You know, it's a very repressive media environment. There's no succession principle. I can stay in power all this time and, you know, no clear mechanism of accountability. And I'm not trying to get in the details of China, but, but you know, it could be that this is a propagandistic, propagandistic use of democracy. And then if we say, well, if that's democracy, I don't want it. We're sort of the anti-democrats. And But perhaps we should have a different attitude toward discourse in that type of situation and be like, that's not democracy. And similarly, all of these things, all of these problematic practices, that's not objectivity. That's um, an appearance of objectivity or using um, the, you know, weaponizing objectivity. I was using, you know, trying to use that word um, before. Um, and I understand why they call it that, um, but by their own lights, you know, I don't think that they're really consistent in thinking you should have a view from nowhere because people don't um, ever have that. So perhaps there's other vocabulary to use, like in the case of the attacks on journalists, it's discrimination, um, or in the case of, um, you know, the how how are the killings of people covered, killings of different people, you know, covered the the white gay men versus the brown gay men, um, the indigenous um, the people versus the 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 white people, and so on. Um, I think that the part of the reason that objectivity sort of falsely appears to be the culprit in those cases is because the the what I regard as the good kind, you know, the objective method really not what they say when they say their methods are objective, they're not, they're not objective. Um, and if they are objective, the problem is not with the problem is not the objectivity. The problem is in this other dimension of selection. So like accuracy. You know, how, given given the questions you're asking, are you answering them in a rigorous way or in a verifiable way? But the problems can lie in which questions are you asking, which questions are you not asking, which things are you making salient, what frames are you using to begin with? By the time you're defending yourself in terms of objectivity, you're already several steps down some path that was begun by the questions you asked. And the problem really, you being the problematic editors, the problematic writers. Um, so the the, the problem is not objectivity, the, 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 what I regard as the good kind and the kind that's just sort of constitutive of journalism, um, the, being an inquiry, that's already, that's, our, that's the kind that happens kind of downstream of the choices where, which are really the locus of the problem. The choices that are locus of the problem is um, whose voices are we listening to, who are we regarding as credible, what questions are shaping our stories, what frames are shaping our stories, and that's sort of neither objective nor not objective. Those are somehow pre-objective or something. They're off stage. They're kind of how, you know, what stories do we tell to begin with? And if we want to, so we need a vocabulary for talking about that. Um, and, and for the reasons I was saying before, if I was, you know, I'm just coming at this, as I said, from this very great distance, but but from that distance, I'm, I'm, it, it just the way it strikes me as, as for whatever it's worth, is that it sort of seems like the vocabulary of objectivity doesn't strike me as the thing that's really getting at the heart of the problem um, when we're talking about what questions, what stories are being written, what questions are being asked, what inquiries are being launched um, to begin with. So I guess those are my thoughts about it. Thank you. Uh, I, I actually want to pick up on something that Karen mentioned earlier, um, which is when you were talking about the editor in the newsroom who's trying to think of how to frame a story um, so that it's relatable to his his audience. And, and I think about this a lot. Um, how do you think, and I'd love to hear from all three of you on this, how do you think um, conversations around a newsroom's audience and who the supposed audience is um, influence um, the objective method or, or any uh, presumptions or, or assumptions of objectivity in, in, um, in the way in which we present, gather and, and report and present news. Uh, Karen, would, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I, I, I like uh, what my colleagues have said, by the way. I think they're, they're both raising uh, really good points and give me a lot to, to think about on the fly here as I go. Um, we do need a language apart from objectivity to discuss the kind of thing that I think we're trying to get at here. Um, so, so how do what happens in newsrooms? Oh my God! In a in an age of clicks now, um, you know, even when I was at CBC, uh, they're watching their website. You know, you kind of think the CBC is going to be the public broadcaster; they're just going to make eat their broccoli. But they're very sensitive also to the fact that they get criticism um, if they're not the number one newscast. And so, what happens is there's a majority population 
um, that can outclick smaller populations. And this has a lot to do with um, where resources go in mainstream news. It's, uh, it, it's, it used to be um, based on ratings in television, but ratings don't count Indigenous people either. They don't, they don't count BIPOC people very well. They tend to, uh, they, they measure five cities the way we do it in Canada. And so they're not measuring rural areas. They're not measuring reserves. They're not measuring the North. Uh, APTN had a Northern feed. Zero people watch it according to the ratings. This is of course not true, but there's no diaries. There's nobody counting. They don't measure it. So it just comes off as a rating of zero. And so you, you need to have a broadcaster that would be like an APTN to say, well, I don't care if, uh, I don't care if it's not commercially viable. Um, we're never going to sell ads because we can't prove that people are watching, but we're still going to serve that community. Um, but this is this is uh, who gets served. And then there's the the selection process that we talked uh, a bit about. I took some notes. So so one of the things I want to say um, coming out of some of the points that were raised is um, finding this other language where we're trying to be, I think, rather than objective method, like just being honest that we're really trying to check ourselves, check our biases and pursue truth, even if it leads us into places that are uncomfortable or into thoughts we don't number, normally think to people that we nor, don't normally talk to. We don't really have that in that, that uh, definition of objectivity, right? And I think that's, that's part of the problem. There are bad actors out there on purpose, sites that are misinformation sites masquerading themselves at news as news that have no intention of playing by the rules. And that's one thing that's going on right now. The other thing that's going on that we're trying to deal with is uh, people like me were always told that I wasn't being objective because, you know, we've had these debates of, was there a genocide in Canada? You know, um, We've said, well, do we use the term land defenders? If I use the term land defender, am I biased? What am I really trying to suggest by, by using that term instead of, you know, like warrior or barricader? Um, if the New York Times, I understand, would not let people wear Black Lives Matter t-shirts. Uh, when I started at CBC, we had this discussion. We said, well, Black Lives Matter is not a, an opinion. It's like a fact, isn't it? So it should be okay to wear that. Um, I feel perfectly comfortable as a journalist wearing a no more missing and murdered Indigenous women shirt, because I don't think there's, I think that's a fact, there shouldn't be any more missing and murdered Indigenous women. I'm not going to take a side on, you know, how to solve the problem, or whether there should be an inquiry or shouldn't be an inquiry or how much money, like that's not my role as a journalist. But the basic fact of saying, of wearing a t-shirt that says no more missing and mur murdered women should not be looked at as bias, but um, in new, some newsrooms it is. And so I'm told I'm biased or an advocate when I wear such a t-shirt. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, wonder, uh, Brandon, would you like to, uh, to respond? And, and uh, coming back, I mean, the, the, the question was, um, was when we think about when newsrooms uh, consider who, who their, or, or assume who their audience is, how does that affect, how does that shape the use of the so-called objective method. Um, but you're also welcome to respond to anything that your co-panelists have said, if, if there's something specific you want to pick up on. Uh, that was to me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, in, in, a, in, in a digital age, our audience is, is everyone, potentially. So I think, I think it's a bit of a, I think there's a bit of a, a trick there in terms of uh, our audiences are often who is, um, we pick our audiences based on who's in our newsroom. And if our newsroom is, is uh, all white and all male, that's generally the kind of audience that gets better served. It's not that no one else gets served entirely, but that's, those are the perspectives that are brought into those, um, into those decisions about what's covered and what isn't. Uh, again, all of those sort of elements of, that go into deciding how stories are put together. Um, I, I'm going to go back again because I'm, I'm really, I'm liking this, uh, Susanna, your, your arguments uh, to reclaim objectivity. I think why I kind of resist it again is that um, I feel like it's a, 
I feel like it's a bit of a, not, not, it is an uphill battle, but I feel like more people use objectivity wrongly than, than the way that we're talking about it. And so I, I, I feel like it would be maybe more productive just to find an entirely different term to talk about what we're talking about, because as much as you might want to define ob objectivity as, as this is the real object, object, objectivity we should be striving for, um, I feel like I feel like that battle's kind of lost in a way, at least at this point, just in terms of people are talking about something very different. Um, they're talking, they're defending objectivity and they're defending practices that I completely, you know, think are don't work. Um, you know, specifically, I think Karen just touched on it again, this the appearance of objectivity being more valuable than actual actual principles we're talking about. So appearing or not to be seen as having an opinion, which is ridiculous in every sense of <laughs> in every context. We all have opinions, we all have viewpoints, we all have lived experiences, but in order to be an objective journalist in a lot of places, it means putting on a mask and uh, pretending to be neutral or, or holding your card so close to your chest that uh, no one knows what your opinions are. Um, so it means, in, in this case, it means not taking opinions on, on things that I consider to just be basic truths, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, <laughs> uh, Indigenous women should not be murdered, you know, those do, those do not seem to be, um, but, you know, we, we end up in using language like advocate or, or activist or movement, um, and, and I think this sort of, you know, does a disservice to all of these concepts, because these, these concepts change, right? Like 15-ish um, years ago, um, when I first started like entered into the world of journalism, um, I was advised to not be out. I, I, you know, I'm gay, I'm queer. And basically I was told if I was out, you know, and this was, this was not an official edict from, you know, this is not an official written policy. This was the advice I was given by well-meaning you know, seasoned journalists was if you were out, you will not be able to cover any of these stories. You will not be able to cover uh, health. You will not be able to cover, you know, there's government policies and stuff because you will be seen as being a biased actor just by virtue of, you know, who you are. Uh, and so that that has changed, I think, in, in, in the subsequent decade or so. Uh, gay, gay issues are no longer treated with the same sort of both sides ism so that we see, um, uh, we, we now see with uh, specifically like transgender and gender issues, we still see that both sides lens applied now. Um, but, you know, again, 15, 20 years ago, um, we were still seeing uh, that we have to have the other side of, of gay rights uh, um, told in the story. We have to have, we have to hear from the religious right. We have to hear from scientists who think that, you know, uh, you know there are heart, uh, health issues for being gay. Um, we've moved past that. We've, it is now okay. Um, we now have newsrooms sponsoring floats and gay, parade, pra, uh, gay parades, and uh, that has changed. Um, but you, we still see those same um, elements. Again, right now, I think transgender communities are facing, you know, a huge onslaught of criticism and attacks um, under this objective method, methodology. Um, and so I, I, I think that the challenge is, is if if the if the baseline is always um, what a white upper class middle perspective deems to be neutral or not, there are always going to be things that are outside of that because it's not their experience, right? There are always going to be people who we don't treat as fully humans, who we don't treat, you know, um, as if they were our own children. It, it becomes an us and an other, uh, and that's where I. That's where I'm still um, uh, resistant to some of these ideas because uh, it's if it's going, always dependent on who's in the newsroom and who's making those decisions, there's always going to be people left out. It just it is unless we can be you know better representative um, at, at those high levels. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, I, I do want to come to you, Susanna, but I think do we have time for questions? How are we doing on timing? Five more minutes and then questions. So, Susanna, if you'd like to take it away, um, 
uh, your thoughts, and, and, and this can be a response to your co-panelists. The original question was about how we consider our audience and who is consuming news um, uh -huh. and, and how that influences uh, our view of objectivity. Uh, mm -hmm. But you're, again, welcome to respond to your co-panelists as well uh, on any specific point. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot. And, and thanks, Matthew. I mean, I think I would agree. I agree that that we need vocabulary beyond objectivity, um, but that won't help us describe all of the things we need to describe in um, in in uh, cultivating the kind of journalism that's that's really needed. I feel like there's sort of two things we need vocabulary for. There's vocabulary for the positive thing, um, you know, that is the what kind of journalism um, do we want to be doing? Do we need to be doing? And if we just say, well, I know it's the objective kind, then that's not going to hit everything. Um, we need to, and, and what, what strikes me as potentially useful here is, you know, we, we need to be giving a fuller picture. So it's actually, you know, if, if the heuristic is like, what would Susie from Saskatchewan think? Pasant Matar taught me that this is a heuristic that's sometimes used in, in, in newsrooms. Um, in the United States, it's Joe the plumber, um, or you know something that that is that that it's a heuristic that you know sneaks in a kind of you know gendered you know it, it sneaks in a basically white gaze of some sort um, in one form or another, uh, and and that's partiality. I mean that's bias. That's partiality. Um, it seems like the that that's lack of objectivity in the sense of not having a full picture. That's anti-pluralism. So if we if we want to flip it and use the vocabulary for describing the, the the positive types of journalism, it seems like you know we're 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 promoting pluralistic journalism. We're promoting journalism stories that give a fuller picture of the community that's um, the journalists are addressing. Um, it's pro-democratic, it's pro-democracy journalism. Um, and then we need vocabulary for the negative things. Um, and that's where the sort of discussion in a way started. So when we're trying to describe um, the problematic aspects of, of journalism and editorial practices, journalistic practices, do we say the problem is it's being objective? Um, or do we say the problem is it's being discriminatory? The problem is it's being partial. Um, the problem is being exclusive. Um, the problem is it's not having a, a full enough picture of the community. Um, I don't know, those, those seem like all things that we could say that really would get at some of the problems. Um, it's white supremacist. I mean, in some contexts, it's useful to put it in those very stark terms and some contexts, maybe it's less useful. Um, but those are the sort of the, the two parts. And I completely agree with the point that if we just sort of reclaim objectivity, it, you know, it won't be the case that everything good that we want to describe in journalism, everything progressive, everything illuminating, um, everything that's really politically responsible will, will fall under that. I agree with that. Um, and I think maybe we should talk about, I mean, to the extent, in, in, in my work, which I always feel sort of like, well, I'm just some lady thinking about this from over here. Um, but I mean, I think of it in terms of salience principles, what principles should guide what we want to make salient um, and how can we think about what those salience principles are. And objectivity doesn't really help with that because objectivity is about this other dimension of you know, verification and methods and so on. But one dimension of inquiry is deciding which questions to pursue and having chosen one question, what's a subsequent question. Um, and similarly with frames, you know, I, I consider that also under what, what kind of, I mean, as a philosopher, I'm always trying to look for general principles of things, um, you know, and what could we say at a kind of general level about what salience principles would promote justice, what salience principles would promote democracy. Um, so those things strike me as giving a book. That's a vocabulary I kind of secretly think with when I'm thinking about these issues. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Susanna. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, does anyone have any questions? And of course, also our audience online. Yes. And please do introduce yourself. Uh, sure. uh, I'm Randy Boswell. I'm a journalism professor here at Carleton. Um, and, and, a, and a, I guess, a frequent writer, increasingly, of uh, political commentary. Um, one of the things that's happening in this country right now is that um, the potential government in waiting, um, uh, the opposition, the main opposition party, the conservatives, it essentially has a policy of ignoring um, 
the mainstream media. Uh, it, you know, not answering questions, uh, uh, essentially circumventing um, what we would see as, you know, the traditional, uh, uh, you know, evidence-based journalism in the country. Um, and of course, you know, there's lots of critiques of the mainstream um, uh, journalism community, uh, as we're hearing here too. But we're in this reality where, you know, possibly the next government of Canada doesn't even communicate <laughs> um, officially with the mainstream media. Um, I'm trying to get a grip on how the debate we're having here about uh, objectivity in journalism can connect to this almost other reality uh, that's happening in our political landscape. It's not really a question. I, I would love to hear from the panelists on this. Um, would anyone like to, to go first? I, I've been thinking quite a lot about that. And it's, um, I, I think what we're, we're struggling with here is a little bit of a, a rise of the, the disinformation sites, right? Because um, what seems to have happened um, is there's a pattern of people that go and they look at mainstream media and they say there's a headline wrong or something wrong and they go, this wasn't right. Um, and they, they, they start developing mistrust with media and then they go to these other sites and there, there's nothing wrong. Like they might have pointed out something that is perfectly logical, great journalism criticism there, what they found. They go to another site and they're not applying the same critique or judgment. So there's, there's something happening in our culture right now that's feeding the ability of disinformation sites um, to create the, 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 this post-truth kind of world. Um, and I, I think what's happening is um, it does give certain politicians who just want to ignore facts or to, to dog whistle or to, um, I don't know, get around the scrutiny that journalists apply um, to, to what they're doing, to, it gives them somewhere else to go. Um, it, it, I, I think that's where you're getting at. Um, I think that we just have to, as journalists, keep doing our jobs. Like, I mean, coming from a world where I spent half my career working in Indigenous media, nobody spoke to us either. It didn't stop us from doing our jobs or holding people accountable. So we've just got to be stronger and uh, stand by the values. But I think the disinformation is happening on one side and there, there is an element of advocacy, advocacy journalism that's happening on the other side. And the advocacy journalism, I think the, the issue with it is that they're not willing to ask the tough questions of the point of view that they're, they're trying to promote. Um, but I'm a little bit more tolerant of it because it's, it's, it's still fact-based and I think it's opinion and I think there's room for it. Um, the danger is the disinformation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to respond to that? I say a quick thing. Um, yeah, just that um, one of the reasons that I mean that the 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 discourse of the discourse of attacking objectivity is a tool of the far right. Um, and to me, and and there's a there's a line of thought that says there's just there's just no such you know alternative facts you know there's there's no such thing as um, there's a kind of cynical mode of this where you say well there's no such thing as really getting it right and so you know you just have to pick your sides who you're loyal to and then the entire discourse becomes about discrediting you know or credibility but not about you know but in in terms of loyalty not in terms of empirically finding out facts. Um, and I'm, I'm very wary of that. Um, I'm very wary of that dimension of fascist political culture. And it makes me nervous um, when on the left, you know, we, we sort of um, become almost adjacent to that by playing into that discourse. Like, of course, nobody's objective, you know, who, how could you possibly be objective? Um, and th the same thing happens with uh, democracy, you know, you point out the ways that democratic aspirations fall short, and then Putin loves to say, so, you know, doesn't look that good, now does it? Um, and it's this kind of cynical attitude. So I, I'm really nervous about that. Um, and 
And that's another reason why I feel like it's good to vindicate the dimensions of objectivity that are really there. Um, so I hope that speaks to the, the question, which I took to be like, well, look, some people not even listening, some people off in this other space where objectivity isn't even taking to be a value. Um, so I feel like defending against that in the same way that I feel like, you know, defending democratic aspirations, even, even alongside all of the, you know, enormous failures of those aspirations. Matthew, would you like to add to that at all? Uh, sure. Um, I, you know, I, I hesitate to, to I, the disinformation piece is, is complicated. It's, it's not, it wasn't created by, you know, a single stream of, of problems. It's, you know, it's a confluence of a, a bunch of things that have gone wrong um, that have allowed this, you know, this side to really flourish. Um, I, I, I struggle with this too, in, in the same way I think that Susanna is talking about is that I, I have some of the very same critiques that are coming from the far right. The difference is we have very different ideas about the solution and about uh, how to address it. I, you know, I, I do think as much as I critique mainstream media, there is also value there. And, you know, it's not something that we should just completely throw out um, at all. Uh, on the other hand, um, it is worth critiquing. And so how do we have these, how do we have these conversations where we can be, you know, I, I, I giving really harsh critiques that I think are needed? Um, because I, I think, I think that some of these, the issues that people are seeing, the, the reason that they're um, feeling so left behind by mainstream media, those, those, I think those criticisms are really valid. I think that under the guise of objectivity, maybe the bad objectivity, but um, uh, you know, lots of viewpoints have been have been excluded. Lots of uh, truths have just sort of been ignored when it's not convenient to, uh, you know, whether it's people in power or corporations or what have you. Uh, and so I think it's um, and if as long as mainstream media isn't really willing to address those issues and and really take them seriously and and really really evaluate how objectivity is practiced in their newsrooms. I think this is a really hard conversation to have because, um, you know, while we all in this room here, the three of us have all sort of agreed that there is bad objectivity and there's good objectivity. Um, bad objectivity is still in the policies of some of these newsrooms, like written directly on paper as, as to how they should be practiced. Um, and so I, I find it really hard to defend um, the way things are, not because they need to be perfect, but because I don't actually see the course correction that I think is needed. Um, you know, mainstream media, and I, and I say this not because I think it's partisan, I just think there, that mainstream media in general, obviously there's exceptions within here, um, has a deference to power and the status quo. And the status quo has, you know, <laughs> let, let's talk historically here, the status quo has been very harmful to my community, to Karen's communities, to lots of communities, and it's been really helpful to rich, powerful people. And so um, that, you know, objective stance, I think really, um, really favors that, um, it gives cover to, I think, those ideas, right? Like, I don't think that there's anything harmful about those ideas per se about defending corporations or defending capitalism or any of those pieces. But when that is defined as the objective truth and everything else is sort of um, held outside of that as, as the aberration or as the activism, that's where we, have, you know, I think this disconnect between what people can see coming from media and then what they experience in their real lives. Um, and, and I think until we can, you know, until newsrooms seriously look at that disconnect and seriously look at how you can actually correct it, um, I feel like a lot of this, a lot of these efforts are just kind of window dressing really. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Uh, we have a question from Zoom. We can have that up. Uh, yes. Hi there. Um, thank you so much. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, and thank you very much to all the panelists and the moderator. This has been a very interesting discussion. I, I, I uh, my name is Aniron Bosley. I teach here at Carleton as well. Uh, I teach an ethics course, so this is particularly interesting to me. Um, my, uh, my question is around the journalism education piece, and so um, I wonder if people think that there's actually. Uh, anything useful still about objectivity um, and how would 
how would it fit into journalism education if you were thinking about, I don't want to put it too crudely, but, you know, thinking about either, you know, something that learning outcomes or, or, or something that, you know, some benefit to students in the discussion around objectivity. And, and like, maybe it's more a piece of critical analysis on, you know, media practice, or like, maybe there's some, still some values. I know that has come up a little bit, some values that are, uh, you know, kind of contained within the, you know, the heading of, 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 of objectivity that that might still be useful, um, although you know maybe not the overall concept. So, I, 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 my, my question is this: what what is still useful, if anything, about journalism objectivity uh, for journalism students as they think about their futures, and just you know what might that look like? Thank you so much for asking that because it was one of the questions on my list that I didn't think we'd have time to get to. <laughs> um, uh, Karen, as a journalism educator, I'd, I'd love your thoughts on this. Yeah, I actually got a lot of trouble when uh, I brought up objectivity <laughs> in my J400 class. Um, it, it, there's, a, I, I think, you know, like, I'm so glad we're having this conversation today because I think it, it's become, um, you know, as Matthew pointed out, objectivity is almost um, a bit of a polarizing conversation. But the thing that I find very useful about it, or very useful about the, the term still, is to use it as a measure of whether or not I can be fair or balanced. Um, you know, I could not probably interview somebody who's really close to me and ask them, the tough questions that um, I, I need to ask them on an accountability interview, because I'd have in the back of my head, what are the ramifications for my family? What are the ramifications for my community? I've, I've stayed out of some Indigenous journalists embrace covering their First Nation. Um, there's a land claim going on in my First Nation right now, where I have very strong opinions on it. I did something that I never do, and I actually signed a petition. And um, I just don't think that I should be covering it at all, because um, not only do I know that I'm having a hard time being fair to the other side, but even if I was, I don't think that people in my community, knowing what my position is, would feel well served by me, you know, the portion that disagrees on me on what to do. So I think that that as a measure of objectivity is still important. So kind of drawing a line between where your personal interests are at stake and, and figuring out where to draw that line. Um, uh, I wonder what you think, uh, uh, Matthew, in terms of how, how um, objectivity is taught in, uh, to, to journalism students. How would you teach it today, if you could? Uh, well, I have a lot of opinions on, uh, on the teaching of ethics, uh, specifically around journalism. Um, uh, I, th I think where I, where I see, um, and this is not really addressing the question, but I'm going to say it anyway. I think where I okay. see the, the, the challenge for me is, um, and I, and I haven't been in day school for a decade plus, so, um, things may have changed quite a bit. Um, I, I felt like, I felt like ethics, is, um, we definitely learned ethics, but I think where, where I saw the challenge is once, once those journalists then went into the newsroom, what stuck <laughs> uh, and, and what, what gave way. And I think what I would love to see is more journalists, young journalists encouraged to develop their own set of clear, un, uh, you know, unmovable ethics before they enter the field. Because uh, I, you know, they're, they're, I see a lot of journalists who just sort of um, move when their newsroom's ethics, when their ethics come into conflict with their newsroom, uh, the newsroom wins more often than not. Um, and so I think until we can, and, I, and I, I do see this happen, I do see this changing for sure, is that I do see students coming out and having very clear sets of ethics. And we've seen some of this, I think, um, publicly in some cases. Um, I, I, you know, I think ethics are, very individuals, you know, my ethics may not be the same as yours or as Karen's or Susanna's, um, but I think, uh, yeah, and I this, sorry, this is not answering your question at all, but I, I would, I would, I would really encourage 
students to have those clear sense of what, you know, where are those lines for themselves and where and where they where they're not going to break. Um, even if, you know, even if it means questioning your boss, even if it means disagreeing with what your policies are. Um, I do think the objective method itself is absolutely something that should be part of, of people's, you know, individual ethics, uh, whatever that methodology may look like for them. Um, the rest of it, I think, I, I'm still ready to jettison, but the rest, we can keep that. Susanna, also interested in, in your thoughts as an educator. Um, what would you think? Oh gosh, I think this is above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> never having taught um, journalism or journalists and never been to J school myself. Um, I, the only thing I might say is to, I think it is useful to draw some of these conceptual distinctions that you know we find in other fields. Um, and you know, philosophers love distinctions. So, um, but in particular, it's not just like the six kinds of the real thing, but in a way, I think I would, if I was, if, if I was like, you know, okay, parachute in for a day and talk to journalism students, you know, assuming they, um, you know, if that were to happen, I think I might talk about just the huge, huge divide. The major divide as I see it is not between number one, two, three, four, five, and six, but between all of those things on the one hand and um, the gatekeeping role, the sort of appearance of objectivity. And this is sort of, I think, a big difference between objectivity and science and journalism, which was another thing we were thinking of talking about, which is that, you know, the, in journalism, there's a sort of personification of like the radio announcer, you know, the TV anchor, the journalist who has a voice in the story. Um, and so it's like, that means that the, there's this kind of like set of cultural cues of what, is ob what does objectivity sound like? What does it look like? And, and, and that's the locus of all this weaponization. You got to sound like this, you got to look like that. Um, or, and, and when people say, when you ask like, would, this, would, would Susie from Saskatchewan consider this objective? What that's really saying is, um, would they find it credible? Which is a completely different concept from any of one through six. Um, so I think I might try to um, just undo the meaning or association of objectivity with that stuff and and contradistinction to all the all the other things thank you susanna do we have time for more or are we wrapping up we are all done we are all done we need a break thank you everybody <laughs> unfortunately i felt this way yesterday i feel like it today i would listen to you all speak for years <laughs> truly i wish we had more time uh, i just wanted to say thank you all for being here for the panelists, uh, Karen, Susanna, Matthew, an incredible discussion. Thank you, Samia. Round of applause. For <laughs> so much to think about. Um, we're going to take a five minute break just before uh, Pacent's keynote, um, and we'll be back at 11.15. Uh, um, so please, for anybody here, grab some coffee, muffins, and thank you again, panelists, and Samia, and uh, we'll be back. <laughs>